Um, I'm excited to be here from California. Um, and this is my first time at the Kivira Coalition Conference. And so I don't know very many people, so I'd like to kick off with just a little exercise to get to know who's in the room. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna read a series of statements. When you hear a statement that you think applies to you, and it's okay if this didn't apply to you yesterday or won't apply to you tomorrow, but if you feel it today, that is your truth, um, I would like you to raise your hand. And then I'll pause. And what I would like us to do is in the pause is to turn and acknowledge each other and take in not so much who individually is raising their hands, but who we are as a group in this room, in this community today. Um, then I will proceed. I have about eight or nine statements. Um, and as soon as I start reading the next one, you can put your hands down. Does that sound good? Great. OK. So I touch animals in my work on a daily basis. <coughs> my nearest neighbor is more than one mile away. I grew up on a ranch or a farm. I know an undocumented farm or ranch worker by name. I worry about how long my body can do the work I need to do. <laughs> a new agrarian. And lastly, I love the work I do. We're a certified organic farm and we grow peaches, nectarines, and grapes that we make into raisins. If you drive out to our farm on any typical day, you'll probably find me doing one of the following things. On the tractor, which is absolutely my favorite place to be, to meditate on ideas, politics, art. It's where most of my inspiration for writing comes. Um, and I also have the responsibility of getting our four-wheel drive Kubota tractor stuck in the mud at least once a year. That's, that's me. Um, I'm bilingual, I speak Spanish, so if you came out, you will often find me in the fields interpreting, um, trying to do my best to cross linguistic and cultural boundaries with as much respect as I possibly can. Um, and it's been a delightful experience to share linguistic lessons on our farm. I always love um, the exchange that happens because I learn new words all the time. One of my favorite new ones is chavelear which is a beautiful um, Spanglish term for shovel, shovel, shoveling to shovel. <laughs> Certified by our Oaxacan workers, I love it. Um, I also, you might also find me and my dad and my mom and my brother around our kitchen table making decisions about what to do. Just a couple weeks ago in October, um, we had over 45,000 trays of raisins out in the fields and we got an inch of rain in seven hours. So as you can imagine, that kitchen table was a little gloomy, um, but we're doing the best we can. Um, and the other part of what I do on our farm is I'm trying to expand what we do to incorporate art, both internally in how we think and work with each other, but also publicly with some fun new projects um, that I'm launching on the farm. Um, so when I talk about myself as a new agrarian, as a farmer, I can't talk about that without talking about genealogy. And when I say genealogy, I absolutely mean the beings and the human beings that I share my most intimate kinship relationships with. But I also mean a genealogy of the land and the place that we are, which inherently um, is in context, larger context of social, cultural, political, and specifically racialized history. My family roots are immigrants, agricultural families from both sides, Japanese American and German American. Um, and particularly the place that we have, the Masumoto family farm, um, we acquired our first 40 acres um, in a really particular time period. 
And this was after both of my grandparents, my Jijan and Bachan, were, um, had lived for three and a half years in Japanese American concentration camps here in the States. Um, and so I just want to take a second to, to really honor that history and share that history with you. So I would like you to imagine this context. Imagine my grandparents at 13 and 17 years old being average American high schoolers one day, and then the next day being cast as national enemies. Um, and then having to leave everything they knew, their homes, their livelihoods, to go on, to be put on a train, not knowing where they were going, for how long they were going, or why they were going, other than they were Japanese American. In that context, that context of cultural exclusion, of racism, of resilience, that is where my grandparents spent their youth. And after being drafted in the army and fighting in Europe, my Jichan, my grandfather, he, in the early 50s and post-World War II, um, he bought our first 40 acres of land. And so in this context, he was rebuilding his family and his life by buying land and literally planting roots in a place that just made him and his whole community feel like they did not belong. That's a pretty radical act, even from my, my grandfather, who was a registered Republican for his entire life. Um, and, that, and I share that story because what I have learned from my family history and, that, um, and the particularities of the land that we're on today is that as people who work on the land, we need to um, remember that the land is not blank, that land is not neutral. But in fact, histories of race, racism, colonialism, among many other individual histories of individual people, they're always enmeshed in the soil and where we are. And so for me, that has been a really formative part of how I think about sustainable farming, that sustainable farming has to include those stories. Um, the second really big key moment in my family and my history as a, as a farmer, a new agrarian, is our transition to organics um, in the er, mid-1980s. My parents decided to transition the farm when, keep in mind, this was still, um, organics in the 80s was still like what lunatics did. Um, my dad tells a story that when, when he started, uh, when he stopped using um, herbicides, someone stopped my mom one day and asked if she was okay and if my dad had died because the farm looked like no one was farming it. Um, so I grew up in this context. I grew up on the, the farm has been certified organic for my entire memory. But even though I grew up there, I didn't understand something really important until I went away for college. I went to UC Berkeley, ran away, thought I would never come back to the suffocating Central Valley of California. Um, but lo and behold, um, my sophomore year, I took an environmental studies class. And in this class, I re distinctly remember there was a um, scientist who worked for, in conjunction with the Pesticide Action Network of North America. Um, and she came in and gave a lecture about what pesticides were doing to our public health and our ecological systems in a global context. And for the first time, I could place what we, what my family had been doing for my entire life in a much larger context. And that was when I realized that I could, in fact, live the val values that I thought I was running away to pursue, I could actually find those most beautifully in the place that I came from. So it was through that process of going away that I realized I wanted to come back. Um, so I came back after UC Berkeley for two years, worked on the farm, and realized I need a little bit more time. There's another passion I need to follow. And so I went to Austin, Texas. I just finished my master's degree in performance as public practice this May. Um, and so this brings me to really the big part um, of my talk today, which is this notion that I've been working with, thinking about, that I'm really excited, and that is that farming and performance 
actually have a lot to do with each other. We're going to do a body check-in. So I'd like you to close your eyes. I'd like you to think, how are you doing? How are you in your body? Trace your body and notice, are you holding tension in any place? Do you feel like you want to move? What do your toes feel like pressed against the earth? What is your breath like? Is it shallow? Is it deep? What does the weight of your body feel like? The bones, the muscles? You can open your eyes now. I just wanted to take that moment to check in with our bodies because I feel like we often forget that we have these live organisms ourselves, which is our, our entire body. And so this idea of the body is really central to my, uh, my thinking about performance and farming together. Um, so what I want to do next is I'm going to ask you to do a, a partner activity. Um, so what I'd like you to do um, silently is look around and find someone near you um, who you'd like to talk with. Great, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have ever thought or said, I could do that with my eyes closed. And that could be anything. If you've ever thought or said, yeah, I can do that with my eyes closed. OK. Now, if you aren't raising your hands, think of something that you could do with your eyes closed. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you um, a few minutes. This is the activity. In your partners, I would like you to talk about what activity or task can you do with your eyes closed. And secondly, how did you learn how to do it? So this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to give you one minute per person. So very succinct, I know. But hopefully, this is just the beginning of many more conversations. And I'm going to ring the gong. When you hear the gong once, that means to switch partners. Then I'm going to ring it repeatedly when we need to wrap up our conversations and come back to a group focus. Are we all clear? Does that make sense? Fantastic. OK, so go for it. That's your signal to switch stories, switch people. So I just quickly would love to hear, what were some of the activities that you can do with your eyes closed? Dance. Dance. Love it. Walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I love it. I heard something over here. One more time? Bridle a, horse. Bridle a horse. That's amazing. When I say that farming and performance are linked, um, I want to expound a little bit more on, because I know this is an agricultural crowd, so we all know what farming is. Um, so what, what do I mean when I say performance? And then these are three parts of performance. Um, so the first one is kind of a two-part. It's that performance involves bodies, live bodies doing something. Okay? And, and when we really think about this, that means that um, having an embodied event means that it can engage all of the senses, all of the senses, which is really key. Um, and then the other part of that, that it's an alive embodied event, um, means that um, there is always room for improvisation, change, adaptation, crisis, um, but that it is something that's shared, right? Performer and audience constitute a performance, a live event, OK? So that's the first, first part of performance for me.